Hi everyone, Path here, and in this video I want to talk about an idea that is very important in the study of physics, but it's pretty much impossible for it to exist in real life or in our universe. The idea I'm talking about is actually a mathematical function, known as the Dirac delta function, named after Paul Dirac. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Let's get into it. First things first, what exactly is a Dirac delta function? We can plot it on a graph to give a very basic description. For almost every single value of x on the horizontal axis, our input value or independent variable, whatever you want to call it, the value of the delta function is zero. But for one specific point, let's say for now at x is equal to zero, the value of the function is very large. It's infinite or undefined. In other words, the delta function is a spike that is infinitesimally thin and infinitely big, while everywhere else, the value of the function is zero. Already, we can see that there's some strange stuff going on. What do we mean by infinitely thin? Well, all it means is that the function only spikes at this value, x is equal to zero. For any other x value, no matter how close we get to x is equal to zero, the value of the function itself is always zero. Now, there are a lot of mathematical intricacies here. For example, is it even a true mathematical function? Also, how do we deal with a function that doesn't change smoothly as we go from left to right, but rather jumps? And of course, lots more that we won't go into here. As a main priority is to look at how the delta function is used, especially in physics. Before we look at its uses in physics though, let's take a look at a couple more properties of the delta function. Firstly, let's recall that for a general function, we can find the area between the graph of the function and the horizontal axis when we integrate that function with respect to x, the horizontal coordinate. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this, the idea is that this area is not easy to find geometrically as most functions are not made up of simple shapes. However, we can imagine splitting this area up into lots of small chunks, finding the area of each one of them by treating it as a rectangle or trapezium, and then adding them all up to give the total area that we're looking at. When we make the width of each little chunk of area as small as being almost zero, this calculated area then matches the true area under the curve. And this is what we mean by taking the integral of the function. Now the delta function is specially defined so that the area under this graph is equal to one. This is very strange to think about considering that there's no area under the graph anywhere except for at x is equal to zero. The width of this function is zero and the height is infinite and yet somehow the area under this function ends up being finite with an exact value of one. If you want to find out more about this, then I'll leave some resources in the description. But this is a property of the Dirac delta function. The area underneath the function is equal to one. Now, here's a separate point. The delta function does not actually need to spike specifically at x is equal to zero. We could actually move the spike to a different x position. If you're familiar with how to modify functions this way, you may know that if you take the dependent variable x and then subtract some quantity, let's say a, from it, then the graph of the function of x minus a shifts by the same amount a. We can do the same with the delta function so that we have delta of x minus a, and then this function spikes at x is equal to a instead of x is equal to zero. The reason this is important is because we can now take another function, let's say the sine function, and we can multiply it by delta of x minus a. Then, if we were to integrate this whole thing, then what we'd end up with is the value of the multiplied function, in this case sine, at x is equal to a. In other words, when used in this way, the delta function can be used to pick out specific values of any function. Pretty cool property, in my opinion. But enough about the mathematical properties of the delta function. How is it used in physics? How does an infinitely narrow, infinitely high function help us describe real life, where infinitely narrow and infinitely large things are pretty hard to come by? Well, even though these sorts of infinities don't really show up in real life, theoretical physics is full of them. For example, to keep things simple, we often treat particles as being point masses. 
What this means is that we assume that the mass of small particles, like electrons, is concentrated at a point, at the very center of the particle. This point is the known as the center of mass, and by definition, a point has no size. It is infinitesimally small. And we often treat charged particles in a similar way. We say that their charge is localized to a very small point, infinitesimally small in fact, to make all our calculations easier, rather than having to deal with charges distributed over a small but finite space. We just say it's shoved into a very, very narrow area, so that it's concentrated only at that point and nowhere else. So here's how we can use the Dirac delta function to mathematically encode ideas like this. We can start by thinking not about the charge of our particle, but rather the charge density of the system we're considering here. Charge density is simply the amount of charge we find per unit volume. To put it in a slightly more correct way, it's actually the rate of change of charge with respect to volume dq dv, which mathematically means that we find the derivative of the charge with respect to volume. This is a bit more technically correct, although we won't go into too much detail here. Now, let's rearrange this equation so that we find the charge of the particle in terms of the charge density and the volume of the region we happen to be considering. To do this, we have to do the opposite of taking a derivative. We integrate with respect to the volume. Thus, we see that the charge of the particle can be thought of as the integral of the charge density with respect to volume. Now, the physical interpretation of this is that the charge of the particle can be given by finding out how much charge there is per every tiny unit of volume in our region of space. We take the charge density, multiply it by each tiny volume to give us the amount of charge in this volume, and then we add up all of those charges to give us the total charge. But remember, for a simple particle, we assume that the charge is actually not distributed at all, and is instead all found at one single point. Let's say x is equal to a. And again, to keep things simple, we'll only look at the x coordinate for now, and we'll ignore the y and z. You could apply the same logic to the y and z directions, since we're thinking about 3D volumes rather than a single dimension, but anyway, here's what we do. We say that the charge density is equal to the magnitude or size of the charge on the particle, which we can call q1, multiplied by a delta function localized at x is equal to a. Why is this useful? Well, let's see what happens when we substitute this back into this equation. We get the integral of q1, which is just the value of the charge, multiplied by the delta function, integrated with respect to volume. Now, once again, this is not quite correct because we're ignoring y and z, but let's imagine that this is roughly what we're looking for. Remember the property from earlier, where we said that the delta function picks out the value of the function that we multiply it by when we integrate? Well, in this case, q1 is that function. And mathematically, if we were just to encode q1, then that would just be a constant function. But the delta function helps us pick it out at the point in space where the charged particle actually is. Now, once again, I should clarify that in reality, the charge would be more spread out and the delta function wouldn't be appropriate here, what with its infinitely small width and infinitely large height. But when we deal with charged particles, they're so small compared to our usual length scales, length scales that we're used to, that the particle may as well be infinitely small and localized just to one single point in space. When we look more closely at a system like this and have to do more detailed calculations, then sure, some of these assumptions sort of fall apart, but for most cases that we're used to, the use of the Dirac delta function is very appropriate. It actually makes things simpler rather than more complicated. Now, let's look at another part of theoretical physics where we use the delta function to try and represent real life scenarios. We're talking about impulses. When we exert a force on an object for a very short period of time, we can use the delta function to help us represent this. This time, not to localize something in space, like we saw for the charged particle, but rather to localize something in time. If we think about a football player kicking a football, for example, really quickly and really hard, then we can say that the footballer exerts a force on the ball only at one moment in time. Now, in reality, the football player makes contact with the ball for slightly longer than just one tiny instant in time. 
but because the force is exerted so quickly compared to how we perceive time, the ball may as well have been kicked in an infinitesimally small time. And the delta function helps us mathematically encode that. In other words then, the Dirac delta function is a physically impossible but mathematically essential function that's not really technically a function, and makes us deal with infinities head on. It's confusing to some degree, but brilliant. And if you want to find out more about it, there's some resources down below in the description. And with all of that being said, I'm going to finish up here. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then please hit the thumbs up button and subscribe for more fun physics content. Please check out my merch linked in the description down below. It features a quantum dice design based on a famous quote from Albert Einstein. And lastly, I want to say a huge thanks to my Giga patrons and all of my other patrons over on Patreon. That's also linked in the description below if you'd like to support me on there. Thanks once again for watching, and I will see you very soon.